Hi, welcome to the Best Life, Best Death podcast. You're listening to Diane Hullett, and my special guest today is Teresa Brown, RN. Welcome, Teresa. Thank you for having me. I'm excited. I guess I'm trying to think where I first heard of your book, Healing. I think I heard of it on Facebook. Somebody may have like sent me a link or something and said, check out this amazing book. So Teresa is an author in multiple ways, but her most recent book is called Healing, When a Nurse Becomes a Patient. And it's a powerful title and it's a powerful book. Tell us a little bit about your experience that got you there. Yeah, well, <clears throat> also, thank you for that very nice description. Yeah, so I've been a nurse for over 10 years, worked oncology, inpatient, outpatient, and then home hospice. And then five years ago, was diagnosed with breast cancer. And the first thing was, <laughs> I thought I knew all about having cancer, right? Because I'd taken care of very, very sick cancer patients. And I discovered I... I really knew almost nothing about having cancer because when it's your cancer, it's, it's terrifying. And so people know I had a, a very small, very slow growing tumor, the most common kind, you know, if, um, if, if you're going to get breast cancer, this is the kind you would prefer to have. Um, and I was still terrified I was going to die. Um, and and nobody except for the ultrasound technician told me otherwise. So that space there between what I was afraid of and what I was not hearing, I kept experiencing over and over again and identified it as a, a an empathy gap, a compassion gap. And then I reflected on moments when I was a nurse when Ah, something went wrong or there was something we would call a glitch probably right oh there was a there was a glitch but it all worked out in the end but when you're a patient a glitch is not a glitch <laughs> a glitch is a huge disappointment where I would find myself wondering what what's going on here are these people even managing my care are they even concerned about my life or what's going to happen to me and this complete loss of trust that happens. And so that's what motivated me to write the book. And, and that's why the book goes back and forth between my diagnosis, my treatment, and then me reflecting on nursing, because it, it's, it's really saying we're not caring for people the way we ought to, and the way that we could and should, I would, right. I would say should. And I think you've nailed it. I think that's exactly why it's such a powerful reflection because it, you really beautifully sit on both sides of those table, uh, both sides of that table. And you, you are able to sort of understand what it's like from the nurse's point of view with a big caseload and a lot of people, and they're trying to manage a bunch of things and they're trying to move quickly. And, you know, of course they're trying to bring empathy and compassion to interactions, but they're also busy. And then the side of what's it like as that individual patient who's who's suffering and freaking out and not necessarily knowing what's going on. So I think that is the crux of why the book is so meaningful and hits such a core uh, experience that so many people have with the medical system and they don't know how to move within that. Yeah, thank you. And yeah, it was really, it was quite startling to me to discover that. And the other thing I was very careful, I hope, what I tried to do in the book, I should say, was not blame individuals. I mean, there are certainly individuals who failed me. Um, and I say, I also realize that I failed people. But the the overarching point is that everyone in healthcare is now working in this system that's so much about making a profit. And you know, I and many other people have been saying this over and over and over again, and it it doesn't lead to significant change. So I'm sorry if I sound like a broken record, but it it's an important message. But that focus on profit puts so much pressure on everyone, on techs, on housekeepers, on nurses, on physicians, everyone. And so the compassion kind of gets squeezed out of people because you're evaluated on What's your efficiency? What's the throughput? You know, how is your documentation? Um, you know, I say at one point, there's no, there's no billing code for empathy. Right. 
Right. Absolutely. And when you're the patient, I'm not even sure you always understand that that's what's behind the speed and the efficiency, or you understand it theoretically, but you're like, but wait, this is my body and I have questions. Right. <laughs> yes. Yes. And it's hard to really think that through. And I would say that's a strength that I really bring to the book because especially from working, I've worked in a hospital, I've worked in an outpatient clinic in a hospital, and I've worked in basically home care and hospice. And so I've seen that mechanism in these three key environments. I've seen how it operates. I've seen how it gets into the nitty gritty of everything. So I tell a story about taking basically two hours of phone calls and text messages and emails to try to get a dying patient, a new fentanyl patch, a pain relief patch. Um, that is not unusual, although it should be. Um, but you're right. I think the average person doesn't understand just how complicated the system is and all the roadblocks there are to clinicians to just kind of doing what you want uh, for patients, you know, um, and that's, uh, it's difficult. It's so difficult. I mean, I love it when I hear of like a medical story that's really positive where people feel like, you know, mom or dad or aunt or sister was really cared for. And, um, you know, maybe there was one grumpy nurse, but overall they felt like the system really had the person. And then mostly I hear stories about people who feel like they got really failed or really beaten up by the system, battered around in, in a way when you're already dealing with some terribly difficult prognosis or procedure or something that isn't simple to go through as a human being, and you're bucking up and going through it as best you can. And then there's all these barriers that happen. Well, you, one of your first books was called Shift. I don't know if you want to just say a tiny bit about Shift. I thought that was such an interesting book as well. Sure. Um, yeah, it's The Shift, One Nurse, 12 Hours, Four Patients' Lives. It's a, it's a nonfiction account of a day in the hospital with me as the nurse, the narrator. And uh, it is based on a real day. Um, where I had one patient who I thought was basically fine and really, really wasn't. And one patient I thought was the treatment for him was going to be a disaster. And that also turned out completely differently than I expected. So at the end of that day, I had this epiphany where I realized, you know, I, I only have 12 hours with these people. That's it. I can't control what happened before I got to the hospital. I can't control what happens after I leave which is, is really one big difference between nurses and doctors. But I have this 12 hours and so much can happen during that time. And that is my opportunity to make a difference. Wow. Well, I can't wait, wait to read that one because I, I think it just looks really interesting. What, what do you think people like with a diagnosis like you had, what, pe what can people expect? And what should people expect? I mean, I think they're two different questions, you know? That Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, what people should expect is that, first of all, their care will be timely. So they won't be initially told they have to wait two weeks or three weeks for their biopsy. You know, if someone thinks you have cancer, you should be able to get a biopsy that day, the next day, in a couple of days at the most, your results should be timely. People should tell you about your prognosis. You know, no one sat down with me and said, look, we can treat this. We even use the word cure to talk about that. Um, I really felt like I was on an assembly line um, and just kind of moving along. Um, and so people can expect efficiency, honesty, um, directness and also clear explanation of the treatments. And so for me, there was a question of, am I going to need chemotherapy or not? And that was just the way that was handled. There's no other word for it. It was just a mess. Um, and for me, it was actually just a no brainer almost from, because I'm a nurse and I worked in oncology. So I did a bunch of reading and um, you know, it's, it's more complicated for other people, but it, it just, was handled so carelessly. Um, and that's the kind of thing that is so hard. And so imagine if my diagnosis was much more serious, 
uh, much more threatening. I shouldn't say serious, but you know, a much more aggressive cancer, a cancer that's much more difficult to treat, where the treatment is a lot more involved. And I had this feeling of carelessness and people aren't telling me what's happening and what to expect from the side effects. And um, so now I've told you what you what should happen and what could happen is that none of that stuff actually happens and, and you feel lost. I mean, I called it DIY cancer care as in do it yourself. And then the question is, how are you gonna handle that? Because I went into this understanding how complicated the system is, how busy everyone is, and the thing I need to be the compliant patient, right? I need the person be the person who goes along to get along. And at some point, I just realized this is not working for me. It's really not okay. And I started to lose my temper, to make demands on people. I mean, I was not abusive. I was appropriate. I, I wasn't right. yelling at people. But you started to kind of get your yeah. head up like, wait, yeah. 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 I mean, and I did some of that at the, at the start, but I started, that became the way I was going to handle things because otherwise everything just was a mess. I didn't get what was going on. Nobody was explaining things to me. And uh, people may not know this, but there are patients and family members, unfortunately, who get classified as difficult sure. and no one likes those people. And um, what it means is that those are people who complain. Um, and sure, if you're complaining because your meal was not at the exact temperature that you like, or right. you know, the chair you have to sit in is uncomfortable. But I, at one point, realized oh, I, I am you know, I'm being that person. Right. And yeah. And I felt, I felt this, I felt this deep embarrassment for a moment. And then I thought, well, I don't have any other choice. Right. Right. Cause um, nothing is happening unless I'm raising, not raising your voice literally, but like raising your voice metaphorically and pushing back and asking for things. Yes. So, yeah. right. So, um, I, I now encourage people be the difficult patient, you know, be, be civil, be right. polite. Don't be rude. Don't be abusive. But yeah, if you don't understand, yeah. say, I don't understand. Please explain that again. You know, if you right. feel like you cannot work with your physician and you can pick another one, do that. Don't even hesitate. Right. Um, right. Pick someone with a personality can fit. I'm struck though, too, by how, you know, in a situation like that, you're exhausted you're overwhelmed. There's so much to do. It's 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 really almost an impossible task to take on to be your own advocate. And I was just laughing in my mind. I was thinking when my mother-in-law was having terrible, terrible back problems and she went into the hospital, was there for quite some time. And at some point, my husband understood so much about what was happening that when he went with her back, that when he met with one of the attending doctors in the morning, the doctor said, now, wait, are you are you a doctor? <laughs> was like no I'm just a super concerned son but we always joked about it that he could say no but I play one on tv you know exactly yeah right but I play he one in like, my real no, life I just, yeah he's <laughs> like I had to learn everything there was to learn and in fact something that he pointed out made a difference in what they did for her care because they were gonna I don't know forget the details of it but suffice to say I was so clear that because she had two young involved smart organized whippersnapper advocates, she got better care. And without that component of people living in the same town and showing up every day and mm. talking to doctors, I think her trajectory would have been very different for this back surgery. So, I mean, how do you do that when you're exhausted? Maybe you're, you're living alone and you've got this new diagnosis. It's just quite overwhelming. Yeah. And, and you make a great point because it, we now accept that as the status quo. Like everyone says, you have to have an advocate instead of saying, why do you have to have an advocate? Yes, yes. Um, you know, we're not asking the right questions. Um, yeah, you, you should not have to learn enough about back issues that the attending physician thinks you're a doctor. <laughs> you know, <laughs> just like yeah. that is, that like, is a ridiculous yeah. standard. Um, yeah. And it's interesting in, in healing, I quote an actual research survey where they asked patients, what do you think of as compassionate care? 
Um, and, and basically the definition was going above and beyond, which I have mixed feelings about because part of me feels like that's a very hard burden to put on staff who are already overworked and underappreciated in many instances underpaid. But on the other hand, is, is that what people feel like it takes just to get the care because everyone's battling against the system that's really not there for patients. And so, you know, it, it shouldn't, the system should be above and beyond. Right. Like oh, that's so well put. Yeah. You no, know, which means meeting us as people where we are, because you're, I mean, even me, a nurse, I'd worked with oncologists. I, I knew the lingo. I even knew some of the doctors. It didn't, it, it didn't really get me much um, in terms of clear explanations, compassion, empathy, um, you know, I, 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 yeah, there I was struck, like everyone I'm, else feeling lost. Yeah. I'm struck by how much of your, your experience was really just craving clarity and communication. Like that meant so much to you. And jumping back to this bigger picture though, is what, of what you were talking about, you, um, you talk about this great book called Compassionomics. Mm -hmm. And I, I thought that was really interesting. And they say in that book, the aim of this book is not to change people's hearts, but rather to change people's minds by sharing the overwhelming scientific evidence about the effects of compassion on patient outcomes, patient safety, provider well being, employee engagement, and organizational performance. I just, I just thought that was so fascinating that there is such solid research that everybody can be happier and it's good for the bottom line, but we don't seem to be doing it. You're right. Everyone can be happier and it's good for the bottom line. And it's not that hard. And uh, that's the point I make when I talk about radiation oncology and healing. I had a great experience at radiation oncology and it was it was really simple things like um, if I didn't use the computer kiosk to check in because I forgot or the secretary would just say, oh, I can do it instead of sort of barking at me about it without looking up like that. You know, you, you don't need a patient compassion initiative to do that. Um, I didn't want to sit in the waiting room because let's make a deal was always on before my treatment and you're like this I don't want to listen to <laughs> yeah and I don't I mean I like let's make a deal but for some reason in that situation it made me very very nervous and yeah. anxious um and I said there's no way we could turn the tv off and they said well we can't do that but you can sit in the hallway and you know five days a week for four weeks a tech came out to the hallway and said okay Teresa we're ready for you there was no attitude about it. There was no kind of, oh, I was looking all over for you. Why do you need this special treatment? You know, it was just, we're here to help you. And, and that's even what the tech said to me. Nice. And so obviously the leadership in that clinic was focused on how can we make patients feel like human beings? How can we meet them where they are? And one of my favorite examples is they had me watch a video of what the radiation treatment was going to be like. And honestly, I remember nothing about that video, nothing. But what I do remember is that they showed it to me. You know, it wasn't even so much that it reassured me, although I'm sure it did at some level, but that they took the time to do that, to say, here's what's going to happen really simple, you know, it's handing me an iPad. Right. We're going to set on. you up in this space to watch this thing. It'll give you information. And you remember more of like the kindness in that gesture than the content of the video. Yes. Yeah. And, and like, you know, I'm sure it was reassuring, but it's gotten mixed up in my mind with those takeoff before the airplane videos. So. Yeah. Yeah, that's funny because I find I don't take in information very well from videos. Like even if I'm told to watch it, I do much better if it's a conversation with a person. But I understand that they've got hundreds of people they're telling that same information to every day. So it's an effective way to communicate. How do you have a follow-up conversation moment? How do you ask some questions? How do you make it more personal? 
I don't know. I don't know. These are such tricky things. And I, again, I think what's so interesting about your book and your experience is that it's really everyone's experience at some point, either themselves or their sister or their friend or their mom or their aunt, or if it's not breast cancer, name a bunch of different male connections, you know, because it's just really something that we all interface with is the medical world and how to do it in the best way possible. Yeah, that's, that's what it comes down to. Definitely. And, and there are people who, who wrote about healing or, and said, you know, when I had breast cancer, I had the best treatment and that's fabulous. But yeah, it, it's, it, it struck me as odd that people sort of extrapolate that out to say, well, I'm sure everybody's getting that when they're obviously not. I mean, if you paid attention at all during COVID, it was obvious how overworked everyone was and everyone saying, you know, COVID just took a situation that was already very difficult and just made it so much worse. Um, so I think it's wonderful that some people get great care. Of course, I, I think that's amazing. The, the salient point here, though, is that for so many people, it's not like that. Well, I'm struck too, Teresa, as we're talking about like the layers of it, right? So you've got like the individual person, their health history, their family trauma or drama mm. or positiveness around health history things. So you've got, are they a sensitive person walking into this? Are they pretty resilient? Are they, what, what's their package that they bring? Then you've got all those individuals that they interact with at like the front desk and the nurse and the medical assistant kind of level. And then you've got doctors and their expertise and what they bring to the package. And then you've got surgeons. And then, you know, you've got these multiple layers of interactions that may work really well for some individuals and may work really poorly for other individuals. And they may even have been similar interactions from the people, but it's such a mixture of those chemistries all coming together and how to sort of make our system work as a, as you said, like an assembly line to get these procedures done and yet to personalize them and really connect so that there's care. I was struck somewhere in your book, you said, you know, you, it's like you, you got it, you got it done, but part of you was lost in the process. Yes. And listening to you, I remembered one of um, the stories I tell in healing about a patient this uh, this guy was getting follow-up chemo, so he was going to be admitted for two or three days. They had him start at our outpatient clinic across the street, and he was supposed to come over, and that was supposed to expedite his treatment, but he was supposed to come having been started on IV fluids, which he wasn't, so I need to start him on IV fluids, which is not a big deal, except that I called down to get a pump and our supply office said, we don't have any pumps, which that's like a restaurant saying we're out of plates. Like it just doesn't happen. Um, <clears throat> and so I thought, okay, that's weird. You know, call back in 20 minutes. No, we're still out of pumps. You know, time keeps passing. No, we don't have any pumps. And I was really busy with my other patients. You know, often you can you can go to another floor and sort of look around and you'll find a pump somewhere that you can take. And I didn't have time to do that. And also I'll own it. I was annoyed. I was annoyed that they hadn't prepared him the way they were supposed to. Um, they hadn't said anything to me about it. And he kept coming to the door of his room and he would look at me and give me a really dirty look. And it was, it, the whole thing was very, uncomfortable and hard. But as the nurse in that moment, I felt like I didn't create this problem. I can't fix it. Um, I'm really busy and he will get his chemo. It just won't start, you know, at 10 in the morning. Maybe it'll be, I don't know, seven in the evening or, you know, it'll all happen. Then once I became a patient, I thought back to that moment and how he must have felt he had been promised, you come in early, we'll get things started early, you'll leave early. None of that happened. You know, maybe he needed to leave on time on that third day or at a certain time because his daughter was getting married or his son was graduating from college. I mean, right? who knows? Or he just wanted to get out of the hospital because he hated being there. The point is, we had promised him something and we had not delivered. And, and there was no mechanism for 
addressing that, for acknowledging that, um, for expediting that, and and also that it kind of all came on me to make that happen, which is another big problem. Um, but um, I, once I became a patient, I, I really felt for him so much more, and 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 saying, you know, well, he got his chemo, we saved his life. It, yeah, that's great. I'm sure he's happy he's alive. Right, but, but there was this like there was this breakdown in the clarity, right? The communication, and so in that moment or in that day, he was kind of lost. Right, and and we could certainly do better. I mean, that's the thing. We have all these resources. We could do better. It's not that hard. Yeah. Well, and I, it's so that's a great place to kind of say shout out to the medical people and all that they hold and do. And there are so many doing a tremendous job. And then how do we keep, like, like you said, not to blame any individuals, but how do we keep moving in a system that can work better for all involved, I think is really the question. Well, what, what else, anything else you'd say that, that is help, you know, here's a little nugget that would help people to know. Um, I would say just keep in mind that most people in healthcare did get into the field because they want, <clears throat> excuse me, they want to help people. There is that desire <laughs> buried perhaps deep inside them. And so politely registering your questions, I think, is, is very important. Um, making clear statements, I don't understand when is this going to happen? Why does this have to take so long? You know, being as clear and calm, which I'm not saying that's easy, but the more you can be that way, the more likely you are to get what you want from the system. But also if you want to go up the chain of command and complain and say, I didn't get this and here's what happened. I approve of that. Um, but try to do it in a way that acknowledges what your provider was doing and that you, you know, you see the pressures on them, but at the same time, what you want and need also matters. Right. Um, it's hard to get that balance right, but the more people can say, you know, hey, this didn't happen and I, I needed this, you know, that puts pressure on the system to change and adapt. Yeah, yeah. We want the system to keep adapting, not individuals to have to keep maladapting. Yes. To yeah. right, get a get right, get a medical degree just so you can manage your mother-in-law's care. Or, or at least play a doctor on TV, right? Exactly. <laughs> yes. Well, well, Teresa, thank you so much. I really, I think this is, I think your book is really interesting. And I think your experience is really, like I said, there's just a um universal is probably too broad of a statement to say it's a universal experience, but, but it's a very common experience to have, um, to either you yourself be the Im impacted patient or to have somebody you love be impacted and how to navigate this with, with, um, some, some calm and some elegance, but not feeling like you're just rudderless stuck in this system. That's taking you places. You don't even want to go how to have some agency and some voice in a way that works with the system for you. So yeah. you you well can said. find out you can find out more about Teresa at <clears throat> TeresaRN.com. Did I say that correctly? Mm -hmm. yes. yes. Wonderful. And you can find out more about the work I do at bestlifebestdeath.com. Thanks so much for joining me, Teresa. Oh, you're welcome. It was a pleasure. Awesome. I wanted to ask you about your columns because you were like a columnist before you started writing a couple of books. I started to call them novels, not books, not, not novels, books. What? How did you get into column writing? Yeah, well, let me say also, it, it's a compliment if someone thinks a nonfiction book you wrote is a novel, so <laughs> it means that it reads well, so. It does um, read well. I've been reading a lot of books in this kind of field and yours is yours is like, this is an author and a writer. You know, not oh, just thank you. Not just like a put together, um, uh, not not like a like a telling of what happened, but actually a super cogent story that is riveting. Yeah. Oh, thanks. Um, yeah. So the writing the columns 
kind of happened. I mean, I, so my background is I have a PhD in English. I taught English in college, had kids, decided I want a different career, basically went back to school, became a nurse. And then I discovered I had a talent for writing much more like journalism than academic writing, which I didn't like at all. Um, and it started because I had a, a patient die suddenly, just a really, really terrible experience. I think it's pretty common for healthcare people. Wow. Um, when you're still pretty new and someone dies who isn't supposed to die and it's bloody and shocking. And, mm. um, and I couldn't put it behind me. So I thought, well, I'm going to write this down. And then I liked what I wrote. And I thought, well, aim high. I'm going to send it to the New York Times. And the Science Times published it. Um, and that's how I got the contract from my first book from that column. And what people said is, this is a voice we never hear, the voice of a bedside nurse. Wow. And um, that was a very powerful message I really took to heart. And then I thought, wow, this is a privilege to try and make our work intelligible to the general public. And that's what I really wanted to do was show what nurses really do and how important the job is. Yeah. Um, so how many, yeah. how many columns did you end up writing? I haven't gone back and looked at them. Oh my gosh. I have no idea. So I, I was writing for the well blog at first, and then I switched over to opinion and now then they recently kind of rearranged that opinion. And, um, but I, I did just have a short piece come out on CNN. Um, Terrific. So I've written for them too. There's something about that 800, 850 words that it, it's sort of just the right length for me. <laughs> yeah, it's like, it's like you have to be pithy and intense and precise and say it. Yeah. So I, I'm actually one of the challenges I'm giving to myself now that the third book's come out. I'm trying to figure out my fourth book, but it's to try and write some longer magazine length pieces because I'm so comfortable in that column length space. Wow. So stay tuned. Maybe I'll write a great I magazine article and you and I can talk about that too. I would, love to. <laughs> I would love to. I feel like also, I mean, an obvious book is a collection of your columns. I mean, that wouldn't even be all that hard to do. Oh, that's true. Yeah. I mean, that seems like a no brainer, even if it's just a slim volume, that's a companion piece, because if people like your writing, I think they'd be really interested in that. I, I mean, I, for one, would love to read like a whole bunch of different things from the point of view of a nurse. Oh, that's, that's an interesting idea. All right. Okay. I love it. When you write it, you can, <laughs> okay. we'll be like, the idea started here. Exactly. Yeah. Someone said to me recently, oh, well, Diane, get another year of podcasts behind you. And then you could have a book that was like the best of podcast quotes. And like, it hadn't even occurred to me because it's sort of like work that's already been done, you know? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Neat. Well, I love it. You said your third book, what's the book I'm missing? You did the, uh, the first book is called Critical Care. Oh, yeah. Um, and yeah. Um, so that was a book about my first year of being a nurse. So it starts with my very last clinical as a student and then takes me literally through the whole first year, um, including the first time I gave chemo and just. Wow. I think um, it's so fascinating that you went from a PhD in English and teaching at the college level back to nursing school. Is there more like behind that story or just? Really? No. And I mean, so this is the irony that uh, now I'm returning to teaching after thinking I wouldn't, but not teaching English. Right. Um, I'm actually teaching at one of our local universities Carlo in their master's in psychology program, a class called healing through writing and storytelling. Um, so there is still a teacher in me and that's probably where I'm going to land, but not, not doing the same kind of teaching and, but also not with the expectation that I would produce academic articles. Yeah. No. Yeah. That sounds like an amazing class. The, oh, thank I, I'm you. Struck by like one of the things I talk with people about is kind of an end of life circular thing is that sometimes people want to story tell as part of a legacy project, right? And yes. So this kind of interesting thing um, 
one woman I know who has a difficult cancer diagnosis, she got very inspired after we spoke to, to um, she, she had like a whole spreadsheet of topics she wanted to write about that mattered to her. And, and she just started them like in a non, like she got out of the idea that it had to be this narrative kind of tale of her life mm. and realized she could just write like vignettes or um, essayettes, you might call them. And, and that I thought was really, really exciting. And then my dad has been writing this year with this program called StoryWorth. And StoryWorth is just this online thing where he gets an email every week that's a prompt. And then the response that he writes goes to him and to me. And then the oh, wow. a book at the end of the year. So we're just at the process of saying, okay, he said, I think I'm done. So now I'm putting in pictures and kind of polishing it. But so like a really simple way for a, a, a lay person to write, you know, and oh, to wow. something about their story, because there's something about stories that are so healing and so powerful. Yeah, that's, that's exactly right. And And what you said about writing these little vignettes, that's what my book healing is really doing is telling all these little stories about me having breast cancer and me thinking about being a nurse to cancer patients. And, you know, they say that trauma kind of fractures your memory and your narrative. And that's how my thinking about my cancer came out just in all these little pieces. I, like fractured. Yes. But, but, you, but you knit it together with you know, research and the compassionomics, that was just the one thing I pulled out, but like things like that, like here's another source and what they say about this, or here's this mm. info and why it matters. And that's why I think it knits together as both your story, but also much bigger than your story, which I think is why it's really neat. I also almost went off on a tangent about my friend who um, had breast cancer, who had a double mastectomy and she went ballistic on some of her hosp hospital people. And at one point, they had some kind of a, you know, thank you to the breast cancer people of the past year or something. And she went to that, she went and found the director of the hospital. And she just said, you need to have a conversation about with me about what my experience was like. She's a nurse. And she's wow. like, I'm going to tell you exactly what was wrong with it and exactly what was good about it. And she said, he was very taken aback, but I think he heard what I had to say, you know, because she just, she just, a ballistic probably isn't the right word, but you know, she just, she's so honest and so forceful. And she was like, it's not okay. Some of the stuff I went through was simply not okay. Yeah, that's great. And I, that is, that is the ideal phrase to use. I think like this just is not okay. Yeah. Yeah. And you can do better. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I thank you tons for your time and your experience and your writing. I can't wait to read the shift. Oh, excellent. Well, you can tell me what you think. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Teresa. Okay. Bye. Bye.